So, you know, we recognize that our term attainable housing is not the traditional term for missing middle housing. Um, our term recognizes a broader range of housing options. So missing, mil missing middle is a, is a term coined by Opticos Design to describe a range of housing, house scale multi-unit structures that are compatible in size and scale with detached single family homes. Attainable housing is a term we're using to include those house scale missing middle housing uh, products, but also medium scale and larger scale housing products that are not necessarily house scale. So to be clear, we envision these larger housing products along our major corridors and not in the interiors of single family neighborhoods. And so now I'm gonna actually gonna turn it over to Lisa to discuss those different scales in, in more detail, including the different types and some of the recommendations that we're making for each of those scales. Thanks, Jason. Our, our approach to attainable housing has focused on three scales, small, medium, and large. And with these three distinct types of attainable housing comes three distinct set of housing typologies with distinct recommendations and implementation tools in each which is with its own geographic focus. For small scale, we are focused on allowing house scale multi-unit structures within the interior of our single family neighborhoods. Our current recommendations would allow duplexes and triplexes through most of our single family zones and quadplexes in areas closer to transit. For medium scale, we are looking at things like stacked flats and small apartment buildings. Our recommendations here is to is to focus this type of product on properties along within our single family zones that front a major corridor. A new method of development within our zoning code will limit the size of units in these projects and allow an increased density for smaller average unit sizes. The large scale includes taller apartment buildings and mixed use live work buildings. We are recommending that we pursue these, these products along our major corridors through a master planning and rezoning process. Today, we'll be focusing our discussion and analysis on the small scale or house scale attainable housing. Next slide. But now that you know what we are doing, the question is, why are we doing this and why are we doing this now? Well, for starters, we think that size has a big impact on affordability and allowing more types of units and smaller units can have a big impact on, on attainability. In 2020 in Montgomery County, the average detached home was sold for almost $800,000, $775,000 compared to $370,000 for attached structures. The graph on the screen shows various housing sale price ranges for houses sold in 2020. From this graph, you can tell that most attached structures were sold for under 400,000, whereas most detached structures were sold for well over 600K, really highlighting the impact that size and type has on affordability. Next slide. Our neighborhoods have become less attainable and more exclusive, and allowing more housing of more types is one way to increase access. In all zip codes in Montgomery County, how home prices have increased above the rate of inflation. Using three zip codes as examples in Bethesda, North Bethesda, and Silver Spring, after taking a few inception, assumptions where we adjust for inflation and we assume debt cannot exceed 35% of income and that the borrower has no additional debt, we found that the typical 1996 house value and the estimated income required to afford these homes has risen dramatically and out of reach for potential homeowners earning below or even near Montgomery County's median income. A family would require an 125K to afford the typical home in Bethesda if home prices were unchanged since 1996, except for inflation. Instead, it requires almost 200K to afford the typical home that has risen in value to over $100 million. And when you look at North Bethesda and Silver Spring, you find two zip codes where you could afford the typical home with an income below the median income if home prices had increased at just the pace of inflation. Instead, you need an income well over the medium to afford the typical home in these zip codes. Next slide. And when we talk about the rationale for doing this project, at, a, at the root of this is an effort to make our, more, our communities more equitable and more inclusive by countering the historical discriminatory aspects of zoning. Zoning determines what can be built where, and by limiting housing options, we have limited who has access to many of our neighborhoods. If we want to diversify our communities, we need to focus on diversifying our housing options. 
Through this effort and in our equity agenda for planning, we also recognize the role that Montgomery planning has played through plans and policies that have created and perpetuated racial inequity in Montgomery County. We have a long history of land use decisions that have created exclusionary neighborhoods and formed barriers to resources and opportunities for people of color and other disadvantaged persons. Attainable housing strategies will not solve inequity in the county, but it's one step in many we hope to take to begin to address the barriers in place that exist for many households in Montgomery County to secure housing. For these reasons and more, we think now is the time to reform our single family zoning standards. And through this process, we've been lucky enough to have a lot of help in pushing the conversation forward, one of them being the White House. A few months ago, the White House published a blog on exclusionary zoning. In the blog, the authors argue that exclusionary zoning are laws that place restriction on the types of housing that can be built in a particular neighborhood can create segregation via indirect methods. The end the administration also announced a number of steps to combat the effects of inclusionary, exclusionary zoning, including an innovative new grant program that awards flexible and attractive funding to jurisdictions that take steps to reduce barriers to producing affordable housing and expand housing choices, which is something we are pursuing. We think that now is the time for Montgomery County to demonstrate bold progressive land use leadership on this issue. Next, I will turn it over to Todd Folly King to discuss the economics of small scale attainable housing. Thank you so much, Lisa. So the initial modeling we're presenting here comes from March of this year, and that effort focused on small scale attainable housing because there are just so many more parcels eligible for that level of development. Uh, under our proposal and or under the, the recommendations we're considering. And also because new development within single family neighborhoods tends to be a bit more controversial. We, um, we set out to figure <clears throat> or, or identify you know, how the private sector might respond if we reformed single family zoning and made different levels of, of multi-unit living permissible. And the map here shows the area that we're looking at. Um, the zoning covers about 37% of the county for, for these single family zones. And it also shows how we divided the county into you know, neighborhood chunks using the regional uh, transportation analysis zones, which come from the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments. The way we went about examining this was to create a residual value model. And this type of model is quite useful for looking at broad geographic areas and asking if the value created by a hypothetical development program sufficiently exceeds the cost um, that a developer would incur building it uh, such that they might, might attempt to do it. And the formula inherently solves for what's best understood as the land budget. Um, you know, more, more formally known as the residual. And, and this is the amount that the builder could spend to acquire the land necessary for the development program without sacrificing the necessary profit. Uh, if that land budget greatly exceeds the expected cost of, of land, we'd say development efforts are likely, though you can of course never guarantee that they would be successful, that a builder could find a suitable piece of land. If the budget is much lower than the expected cost of land, you'd say that, that it's unlikely that a builder finds the right piece of property at the right price to, to make the effort worthwhile to them. The type of model takes four steps, which we show here along with some of those key data endpoints, inputs. Um, you first need to figure out what it is we're trying to build and, and how much that program is going to cost, excluding land, of course. Then we need to figure out how much value that creates or you know, really how much could we sell the resulting units for. Um, thirdly is to then figure out what, what is the expected cost of land. And lastly, it's to generate the results by comparing that difference, that residual um, between the value created and the, the development cost uh, to what, it, what we expect it would, it would cost to buy the land. Um, the next slides walk through that basic process and how we did this. And this slide shows the programs we evaluated and what we expected they would cost. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the specific numbers. I'd be happy to connect with anyone who has interest in them after the presentation to discuss the details. Uh, what is important here is, is to just take away the three basic programs that we're presenting today. Um, back in March, we didn't know exactly what the recommendations would look like, so we chose to, to evaluate a range of different densities, 
really to convey to the planning board how the intensity of development we allow would influence the, the feasibility of, of, of supplying new units into the market. Um, and as you can see, we, we started with comparing from you know, small duplexes up to, up to a, a sort of a modest level of townhome density. Um, to estimate the value created, the second step, we need to compare to similar development. And the problem with missing middle is that it's flat out missing. You know, we haven't built any in the last 60 years, so we don't have a new building that we could point to and say, well, clearly that's how much people are going to value this type of development. Um, so instead, we looked at the value created per square foot by recently constructed townhomes. And we chose townhomes because they contain a number of similar attributes to missing middle, uh, like shared common space, you know, shared walls, such that we'd say, you know, this is, this is really the closest example we have, even though it's not exactly perfect. And the map shows here, you know, the recent examples we had to work from and the value that they created, which is measured by actual sales of recently built townhomes. And you'll note a lot of neighborhoods do not have you know, examples, um, which, which gets us on the next slide to, you know, the art in modeling. Um, we had to extrapolate to every neighborhood with single family zoning, what would a hypothetical new townhome in that neighborhood potentially sell for? And again, a townhome that is, you know, similar to what we might expect missing middle to be. Um, and, you know, this is, this is what happens in modeling. You have to extrapolate out from the data that you have to, to understand what the world in the future might be. Uh, next, going to the, the cost of land, the third step. Um, this is actually a lot easier and nicer because we have a lot of single family homes. And so we have a lot of data of actual sales to work with and there's, there's less extrapolation here. And what this map shows is the average cost per acre of land for, for single family home properties that sold in, in the last few years here in Montgomery County, averaged at the, the, the neighborhood level. Um, the next slide starts to put everything together um, where we need to understand the resulting outputs. And the, the four colors simplify the comparison of residuals um, and the, the, land, you know, the comparison of the land budget to the cost of land. So if that, if that land budget was less than the, the actual cost of development, you know, we'd say that development's impossible because it doesn't even cover the cost of construction and, and without massive subsidy, no one's gonna undertake that. And so that's shown with the light gray. Where, where that residual was positive, where the land budget is, is a positive number, but is less than 75% of the expected cost of land, we would say development is probably unlikely. Um, you know, a builder may find a sufficiently low cost piece of property, but that seems like a bit of a stretch. Um, and that, that color is red. Where the land budget's between 76% and 125% of the expected you know, cost of land, the, the cost of that average um, acre of single family homes, uh, it seems like there's potential, you know, perhaps the builder will find the right piece of land at the right price. And, and so we show that with the color yellow. And then above 125%, we'd say there's, you know, likely a strong profit motive. Um, it seems that development efforts would be very likely for this program that we're evaluating. And while you can't guarantee success, um, you'd think that someone would probably try. The next three slides show three maps, which put, put the results together for that initial program set that we looked at. Um, and this is looking at a small duplex. So, a, you know, a 2,000 square foot property with two units. And there's just about nowhere in this county that that generates enough value to make it likely that builders are going to try and acquire and redevelop existing homes of, of average value. Um, they just don't create enough habitable space to generate the necessary value at sale to, to you know, have a land budget where you can go out and buy a home and redevelop it. Um, the next map shows larger duplexes. So here, I think we increased them to, from, you know, 1,000 square foot units to 1,800 square feet. So it's, you know, a, a pretty large house. Uh, there's a lot more habitable space to sell. This generates a lot more value. So the, the, the land budget is a lot higher and it's closer to what we expect the, the builder would have to pay to acquire the land. Um, in a fair bit of the down county area here in, within the beltway, uh, the builder may be able to find the right property. 
Um, but that's hardly an indicator that you know an entire neighborhood is going to suddenly change over and become duplexes because it's it's really not a you know a very strong profit motive. It's really right on the bubble. Um, so in terms of the size of this, you know, a large duplex would be would be bigger than many of the older homes in, in the down county neighborhoods. But it would actually be pretty similar to the size of new custom homes that are getting built in the county. So it's still within that you know, house size that, that, that you're seeing at the small scale. The last program we presented was a, you know, a moderate density townhome development. Uh, and the numbers work out, you know, because you're, you're really increasing the density. There's, there's quite a bit more, you know, habitable space to sell. Um, and it, you know, in, in, in most of the, in basically all of in the, the inner beltway area, it, it would look like development efforts would be likely, whether they would succeed or not, whether they'd be able to, to find and get the right piece of property or not. Um, the key issue, of course, is that this type of development is a pretty strong physical break or transition from the existing neighborhood uh, in terms of the physical form and size. And we just we don't have very many examples in recent decades of municipalities increasing the development potential so dramatically across such a large area. Um, so this, you know, this initial effort was really to show the planning board, you know, what happens as we start increasing density or what happens when we, when we allow more versus less and what we might find. Um, so after that initial effort, we went back to the drawing board and, and we asked, you know, what if anything gets built in established single family zones that, that isn't such a departure from the existing form of the townhome? And the answer is, you know, there is something. And, and that's what this slide shows. So this is a property in Kensington for sale right now. Um, and you can see the old house on the left and the new, what we're calling replacement home on the right. So from a small post-war post cottage, you know, we're getting, we're getting what I'd call American Gothic on steroids. Um, and there's a robust industry of builders in our county that is going around acquiring properties like the one on the left and turning them into what you see on the right, um, right down to that same architectural style. They're almost all cookie cutter. Uh, so this is done by right right now with, without any planning department review as it completely fits within our zone. So we, we dug into this and tracked the industry. And the map here shows all the examples we found from 2011 to, to 2020. We focused in on the down county area. There's a couple examples up county, but it's only like less than five. So we've we've made the map bigger so we could really see things. Um, and this was a pretty consuming effort. You know, we first had to build by hand a database of of examples, which we did by going through the the back issue of the Montgomery County Real Estate Newsletter because they they list out builder sales like this. Um, we use that database to identify common features of replacement homes, which is what you see on the slide in those bullets. And then we we took all single family home sales in the county going back about 20 years um, from a, a service called CoreLogic. And we, we gave it to a colleague of ours who has a PhD and is proficient in the, the, the software R. And we told him, find all the properties that meet this condition, um, which he very graciously did, because uh, that was not something that I could do. And what it led to is this, um, about 600 to 650 examples in the last decade, about you know, 60 to 75 a year. And so to, to speak candidly, what you're really seeing here is, is effectively a map of our school districts. Um, the homes being built are, are mostly in Bethesda, North Bethesda, Chevy Chase, and a part of Kensington. And those schools, you know, those, those areas track to some of the more sought after schools in the county. And there's a, a somewhat less active market in Silver Spring and Tacoma Park, you know, an area with very good regional access and, and good schools, um, but, but slightly less perhaps, you know, impacted than, than the ones more to the west of the county. Um, the next set of slides shows how the replacement home industry works, and and you know the findings from these led us to revise our effort to model the potential impact. Uh, the graphic here plots the ratio of every single sale of a single-family property between 2015 and 2021, you know, all arm's-length sales, against the average value, you know, the average sale value within that that neighborhood. Um, and what it shows is that within every neighborhood, most properties tend to be right around the average value. You know, they, they tend to cluster around that ratio of one. There are a few that are much cheaper. There are a few that are much more expensive. 
Um, the next slide shows what the, the, the custom home builders or the replacement home builders are actually buying. And the purple line is plotted against the right axis to, uh, the right axis to accentuate the, the data trends that you can see. Um, and they aren't buying average homes. There's, there's no examples that we found of a builder uh, buying an above average price home. Instead, they're buying the most attainable homes. The, the, the about 10% of properties that sell for between 30 and 70% of average value in any neighborhood. And that, that weighted average cluster is right around 55%, which is a number that'll be important in a few slides. Um, the next slide shows what they then sell the resulting new home for, and it is almost uniformly above 125% of average value, and, and many are for much, much more than that. So in some, you know, builders are buying the most attainable homes in the most desired neighborhoods, and they're converting them into the most expensive homes. And so if we do nothing, you know, over time, we're going to lose the few relatively affordable properties that we still have in much of our more accessible and, and more desired neighborhoods. Um, this next map shows this process at work in a part of Kensington, and we've chosen this neighborhood uh, just, just because it has a, a, quite a lot in a, in a few block area. Um, the entire neighborhood had about 50 replacement homes going back over the last 10 years, and Builders bought properties for just about half the average home value, and they sold them for, again, you know, um, not quite one and a half times the average value. And on the, on the map, um, at each red, each red dot, which is, you know, an example of a, a replacement home, the price in parentheses is what the builder bought the property for, and then the larger number is what they sold it for. So, you know, they, they, they got many of the homes that sold for less than $500,000, which I think as many of us know, you know, anywhere within the beltway that that's a really affordable property um, and we simply lost them uh, so based on the on on sort of these findings we went back and reran our model um, and instead of looking at the average value property we looked at replacing a home at the 55th percent of average value you know what the what the builders are targeting and building a duplex. Um, at this point, you know, we had more input from the planning board. So we modeled the duplex with units that are 1,500 square feet, you know, uh, 3,000 square feet total for the, for the structure. And we did that because um, we're at the moment in our recommendations looking at capping the average unit size for these defined attainable housing projects at that level. Um, and so, you know, if, if the average unit size is larger, it, it wouldn't be, within the category would not be able to, to proceed you know, with, with by right um, development. So we'll note here, you know, a lot of the inner beltway of the county now looks attractive for some level of attainable housing. And, and you know, let's note, it, it does not mean that we're gonna see wholesale neighborhood change, uh, that duplexes will, will replace every home on the block. That market size is going to be very limited because, as we showed, you know, only 10% of homes are are selling at that much cheaper price point at between 30 and 70% of average value. So the impact to our supply is going to be modest, in line with that first first round of, of modeling we did. Um, but it does show that you know it's not going to be zero. There is potential here. You know, it will be attractive at some level if builders can get some of those properties at at that lower cost. We just presented this this month to the planning board. So this is relatively recent work we did. Um, this last slide is to sort of to go through the, the conclusions that we took from this. Um, and the first is that in a region like ours with high housing costs, you know, where there's a lot of demand for single family homes as they are, um, in very few neighborhoods, if any, will single family zoning reform that, uh, that, that requires sort of house scale or the existing type of building and scale, it's not gonna generate many units anywhere. Um, existing homes are just in too much demand. Construction is just too expensive for this to be widely profitable. But we will see modest amounts of missing ho middle housing built um, and it'll replace some of the cheapest properties in the most desired or, or wealthiest neighborhoods that would have otherwise become enormous replacement homes. Um, so, you know, let's note, even if this is modest, this is positive. And, and any new supply is helpful. Um, and the last thing I'd like to, to, to point out is to remind you of the, 
the sort of the studies that we showed at the beginning from Portland and California. I want to stress that we published our findings first um, to, to you know, petulantly insist that we get some credit there. Uh, those were from late in the fall, and we had first come out with our findings in March. So we were first. Um, my colleague Lisa is going to now lead us into the discussion by, by laying out why we still think this effort is so essential and so valuable. Thanks, Todd. Um, I'm speaking to a group of planners, so I think I can say, you know, you probably realize that while many people have expressed support for this initiative and its recommendations, as you can imagine, this issue has been immensely controversial throughout the whole county and has been subject to protests, flyers, and email, cam e email campaigns from uh, pretty much all of the many of the HOAs and community groups in Montgomery County from both sides of the political aisle. Even with the backing of the White House, some of our most liberal neighborhoods in Montgomery County have fought this initiative. Um, the concerns have really focused on the changes to the physical character of the neighborhood, parking, traffic, demands on infrastructure like schools and roads, the actual attainability or price of these units, concern about gentrification and displacement, and especially tree canopy loss. Um, we are currently working with the community on how to balance these issues and will continue to do so throughout the work sessions on this initiative. However, we feel that the recommendations we are moving forward have really focused on maintaining that house scale. And we think it takes away some of those arguments about changing the physical character of these neighborhoods. Next slide. As Todd walked through in his analysis, we think small scale attainable housing types will have a modest impact on housing supply. And we think that's okay. We think reforming single family zoning is an important but incremental step that will not significantly change our neighborhoods overnight. As Todd highlighted, we think some of these homes will still be replaced by large detached replacement homes, but our hope is that over time, some will be replaced by small scale attainable housing. And I'm sure as planners, you've all heard the term gentle density used to describe the small scale, house scale, missing middle or attainable housing. And we like using that term. We think building more housing in single family zones doesn't require high rises or significant upzoning. Even a small incremental change to our neighborhoods will have a positive impact on housing supply. And not to mention, as mentioned early, this initi initiative is important to meeting our equity goals by reducing barriers to many of our single family neighborhoods. We also just think that more housing options and more choices is a good thing. It's for downsizing seniors, for entry-level homeowners, for multi-generational families, and anyone who's looking to access the housing market in Montgomery County. On the left, you see a large single-family detached replacement home that is currently allowed by right in over one-third of the county. On the right, we show the same structure, how it could be a duplex, but this is not currently permitted by right in almost all of the county. When we, what we are talking about is more options, more diversity, but generally the same physical character. In summary, we think that for all these reasons that we mentioned, reform is worthwhile. Reforming single family housing will help us meet our equity goals, help increase our housing supply, housing options, and improve access to home ownership. Can you click, Jason? So rather than ask why reform single family zoning, we like to ask why not? We think we've made a compelling argument that reforming single family zoning is an important and necessary step in moving housing policy forward in Montgomery County. With that, next slide. Uh, thank you. This is all of our contact information in our website and we can certainly give it to the organizers if anyone's interested in seeing this presentation. Thank you all. Uh, we will try to make the presentations available at either the recording, maybe also the PowerPoint, if you so choose. We can put it on our website for clickable links. Um, I have seen a few questions and uh, no, no answers yet, but I've seen questions in the Q&A portion. Um, and I'll just read them out so everyone can hear them, but can you guys read that as well? You can think about it to see the Q&A window. Okay. Our, our first question is from Stephen Krim at DDOT. In your modeling, did you attempt to estimate an increase in land cost if the land were rezoned from allowing only single family housing to allowing the types of housing you're evaluating? That's a, that's a great question. And I will say we did not because the, there are a number of other challenges with building multi-unit structures that, that are not purely reflected in the numbers there that we didn't discuss in detail. Um, 
we had a, a group of, of stakeholders in the building industry, um, community members as well, um, that advised us as we were coming up with the initial set of recommendations. And the, the builders, the brokers, almost uniformly talked about how hard this is going to be such that you know to really limit the expectations of how much um, how much new development we're going to see and so the result from that is I you know we do not think that the the at gentle density you know one to four units um, that there's going to be so much demand to build this that you're actually going to see any change to property values um, you know from 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 this aspect alone which of course is going to be hard to to really model out because it's hard to see the, the, the countervailing or the, the counterfactual. Um, but so the short answer is no, just because we think the development potential is so modest that it's not gonna affect the market price. Okay, I'm gonna go in order of what I saw. I see some questions in the chat as well. So I'll give um, the next question about demographics. Did you look at demographics in terms of your analysis or was it primarily about uh, house value? I'll take that one as well. That, that's also a great question. Um, when we we did, we we did not present the findings from that. Um, at our at our most recent planning board, we actually presented uh, quite a bit of data that we did looking at the question of gentrification, in which we went deep into the demographics for the county and where, you know, what 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 do the neighborhoods where we think this is most likely, what do they look like, and is there is there a potential for gentrification? Um, that, that data is actually public. Uh, we presented it just the other week, you know, November 4th, I believe, to the planning board, and that's uh, up online. So, you know, we, we have looked at demographics. Um, just in the interest of time for today, it's not something we're presenting today. I know you would have. I mean, you're good researchers. You would have thought about that, right? All right, next question. Other than the value of the new house will be double, what else do you want to review if a replacement is proposed in the single family residential zones. So what other aspects I'll, would change, I guess? So I'll, I'll take this from the modeling side in terms of the, you know, interpreting it as, you know, how did we identify replacement homes? And then Jason, Lisa, if you have thoughts on sort of what type of review we might want. Um, from the from the data side, what we saw is you know the, the the new home is double or more in value. It is built in less than two years, so the, the builder buys the property, builds a home, and then sells the property again within two years. So you know value is doubling in two years. Um, then we we imposed a number of conditions that you know the property couldn't have been subdivided within two years of the builder buying it because there are a lot of there are a lot of what are called builder lots where a, a developer subdivides a piece of land. There's nothing on it before sells the individual lots to a, a home builder. And so, you know, that that's not a replacement home. That's just a sub subdivision of suburban development. Um, we put in a condition that there had to be a house on the property in the year, I think 2000, we had sort of a, a you know, a, a, not a, a data set that showed what, what properties had houses on them. Um, and so those were the, the main, conditions that we used and we did you know we spot checked we we um, went through to do some quality control and stripped out some kind of weird looking uh, transactions that were probably not arm's length um, so that was that was how we did it I'd say it was fairly time intensive and a lot of work with my colleague who, who has a PhD and was immensely helpful yeah, and I would add that if um, if the question was less about the analysis that we conducted and more just about the policy, you know, we're hearing a lot, as Lisa mentioned, about things like uh, infrastructure, impact on schools, and um, parking, uh, and and so you know, for certain things, uh, things like trees or uh, water and sewer, and impact on that, you know that it's not necessarily something that's a, a unique to these new multi-unit types of housing products, right? So it, it, it may be something that we need to look at, uh, look at generally or outside of th this particular case, right? Um, so, you know, things like schools, we have a pretty extensive process in place to, to monitor uh, school enrollment and, uh, and impacts of new development on that. And 
you know, one thing we're starting to look at now is trying to isolate, and we don't have many of the, much of this in the county already, but these missing middle attainable housing types, what are they generating in terms of students? And, and, and so what can we expect to come from this uh, in the future? And, you know, does the system that we have in place, our adequate public facilities uh, policy, is it prepared to be able to, to, to respond to changes that might occur in a neighborhood? And again, you know, we, we don't anticipate large uh, wholesale change in neighborhoods. And so we don't think that, that, that any change from an enrollment perspective would be fairly incremental, just as the housing uh, diversity would be incremental. Um, and so I think that, uh, you know, some of those things we, we just need to continue to monitor and uh, evaluate as we go along here. Okay, well, here's another question in the chat, and this could probably become a whole new session in and of itself, but how do you change the World War II mindset of the single family home community to a more diverse housing opportunities community? Yeah, I saw that. That's, I think this is a really interesting question. Um, and um, we, we, I feel like we're tackling this on a, a daily basis right now. Um, it, part of it is that what the way we're approaching this is we're not really looking to introduce, you know, apartment buildings in our single family neighborhoods. We're really looking at finding ways to make those single neighbor, uh, single family neighborhoods attainable to more households, right? To, so how can we have more families, more households be able to reap the benefits of home ownership and reap the benefits of living in those neighborhoods that are so desired, right? That those single family communities that people have envisioned since, you know, post-World War II, right? So, um, and I, you know, a lot of, uh, we, you know, we're, we're, we're just trying to, to recognize well, the, the, the stuff that Lisa showed, those, we showed those three zip codes. I mean, an important thing to note from there is we looked at every single zip code in the county. And in every single case, it is less, each zip code is less affordable today, affordable to fewer households, a smaller share of households than they were 25 years ago. And so that means, you know, in certain neighborhoods where you could afford to live in that neighborhood, that zip code, if you made 75% of the average, uh, the county's median income. Uh, now you can only uh, do it if you make the, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the top, you're the top 50% or the top 40%, right? So the, each, uh, each zip code is attainable and, and affordable to fewer and fewer households. And so the question is, how do we make these neighborhoods more attainable to you, your children, you know, the next generation? Because we hear this a lot from people saying, my kids aren't going to be able to live where I live. Um, and it's even more so the case, you hear that from people who don't have that generational wealth built up to be able to pass on so that their kids can live in these same neighborhoods. So, you know, it's really focusing in on like, who are we trying to impact? Who are we trying to help out here? And, you know, in some cases, you know, it's your own children that we're trying to, to and we're just trying to open up neighbor, these same neighborhoods that everyone wants to live in to more households. If I can just add to that, I'd say the point about it being for our children is especially important because we're, we can't roll back the clock. We can't undo the price increases that, that have occurred to date. The cost of construction is insanely high. So the cost of new development is, is going to be high. You know, what, what, whatever is built new today is not going to be quote unquote low cost. But when we go out 20 years from now, it's a question of, did, you know, did we take action today to bend the curve to change this trend such that there are more units that are smaller in the future that our kids could possibly afford it um or did we do really nothing uh and you know i, I think it, you know it, it's very important that we that we take action whatever limited action that we can so i think you hear you saying it'll take a while to change mindsets but that's part of it all right um Here's another question in the Q&A. Uh, do we know if similar analysis is being done in Prince George's County or other neighboring jurisdictions? I think you mentioned Arlington County. Um, I know Rockville's considering some of this, maybe not to the same extent, but um, what do you know about other areas? Sure, I can take that question. Um, as Jason said, we've we've had you know a couple of conversations with Arlington. Um, we also have had conversations with Prince George's and the city of Rockville. So we certainly see that you know we're in this together as a region. I think we're uh, a little bit ahead of some of those jurisdictions in terms of where we are in the process. But it's you know I think that it's been very beneficial to talk to other jurisdictions that have gone through this.
Okay, thank you. Um, Eric and Osberg says, uh, besides limiting the size of units, have you explored a relationship of tying number of units to the amount of land on the lot? Changes to the R4 zone in DC, for instance, a few years back requires 900 square feet of land per unit for row house conversions. Um, who wants to take that one? I can take it. So um, I don't think we have necessarily tied it or had a lot of conversations about tying the number of units to the amount of land on the lot. Um, we have minimum size requirements and we have also had conversations about allowing this type of housing on substandard lots. So for example, in R60, which is one of our single family zones, the minimum lot size is uh, 6,000 and we have worked with the planning board to allow this type of housing on uh, smaller lots than our 6,000. So we think that that's a really important conversation to have to make sure that in a lot of our down county where the lots are smaller than the minimum lot size that we can still build this, this type of housing. I think for some degree we'd also say for the, the, the higher size, you know, four units, you simply aren't gonna be able to fit them on some of these lots and that's okay. Sure. You know, not every lot is going to be able to fit everything that's needed. And that's just, that's what it is. You know, there's some 90,000 single family parcels that are within this, these zones and some may not be suitable for more than two units and some may not even be suitable for two. And if you can't fit it, well then, you know, we're not, it's not perfect. Okay, good. Hopefully they answered the question. Um, I'm not saying it didn't, I was just leading to the next one. <laughs> Uh, our next question, and we just have uh, maybe 10 more minutes before we close out the hour. So there's a couple more questions we can go over. If the possible impact is limited by stirring up the pot of single family dwelling, why not focus your efforts on those other housing types that will really have huge impacts on the home ownership? Sure. So I think, well, we are. Um, at the beginning of the presentation, we talked about the medium and large scale type of attainable housing. We really see that the increase in housing production will happen um, in the medium, which is, you know, stacked flats along our corridors or, you know, small apartment buildings through master planning efforts. So it's kind of an all of above type of situation. We also at the same time have a general plan that we're working on, which is uh, our version of a comprehensive plan called Thrive Montgomery 2050, where we have kind of thrown the kitchen sink at housing policy, trying to not only increase access to home ownership, but increase the number of income restricted affordable housing, um, and increase the, the number of market rate affordable housing. It has a lot of, you know, policies like community land trusts, which are linked to home ownership in that document. And so we think pursuing those types of um, policies is really important because the reality is, like the comment said, the housing shortage in Montgomery County is so severe, we really have to do everything possible to um, increase our housing production. Let me also jump in, you know, add on to that by saying, you know, that really gets to our last slide. Um, where we, you know, we said, why not? And the and the, the reason for that is, you know, we showed there's not going to be a huge amount of new units within neighborhoods. You know, it's going to be modest. Um, but when it's modest, it means that the impact to existing homeowners is also pretty modest. The concerns that you're going to overwhelm the parking, the schools, the parks, the sewer and water. So, well, if we're only going to have, you know, an incremental number of units, then that's just not true. So, you know, we, we aren't going to have a negative, you know, we're not going to impose a negative quality of life on surrounding homeowners as a result. You know, we've, we've addressed a number of other concerns that they're not presented today about what that might do to taxes, about gentrification. You know, we've systematically gone through these objections and with each one, you know, we have not found them to be, you know, to have, to have significant merit. And the result is really this question of, well, if it's not going to affect existing homeowners to much degree, then why not do it? You know, it's not why do it, it's really why not. Um, and we, I see one more question here, um, and feel free to type another one if you think of it, but uh, Carter Reitman asks, considering that the impact on the housing market from these changes is so modest and the affordability crisis is so severe, what are the next steps for ensuring greater affordability in Montgomery County? 
Yeah, so I think we, we mentioned that earlier that we have, you know, a general plan, comprehensive plan that lays out a vision for housing in Montgomery County, which really, you know, tackles it from, from many different angles. We see this as one step, one incremental step at increasing housing supply and increasing access to some of our single family neighborhoods, which have had barriers to development in them for forever. And so we think that it's a really important step, but that doesn't mean that we're not going to pursue other policies like, um, you, you know, our in increasing our inclusionary zoning requirements or making, you know, changes to the inclusionary zoning or increasing funding to our housing initiative fund. So there's a whole bunch of other things that we need to tackle in order to help ease the affordability crisis in Montgomery County. I'd also say it's not just us, you know, it's not just Montgomery County, it's a, it's an affordability crisis in just about every major metropolitan city with a, a strong job market across this nation. Um, and I think part of the problem is that we have really built out the limits of what our infrastructure currently supports and much of that infrastructure was built with considerable state and federal support that has just not been there in, in you know, 40 years or so. Uh, and I just saw a presentation the other week, a great presentation out of the out of George Mason University, where they're looking at the, the development history of Northern Virginia. And they're concluding, you know, the, the presenter was concluding with a similar point that there's not much land left in Northern Virginia for untrammeled growth that's not already built. And as we showed here today, it is immensely difficult to redevelop existing built out areas. Um, and so if we're, you know, if we're not expanding the, the urban geography of Washington, D.C., which, which has considerable negative impacts for quality of life, um, you know, it, it's why we have an agricultural reserve in this county that's so important, then we have to sort of address this. You know, how do, how do we get more units out of the existing built area to, to support this continued growth of our economy and, you know, the people that want to live here? Or we will suffer from, you know, becoming an island of of elites that no one can can really access, and the, you know, the negative effects for for society that that implies. Okay, thank you. Uh, two more questions here. Thanks for um, keeping them coming in. We have a few more minutes before one. Um, did your economic analysis look at the likely prices of new housing types? compared to the cost of new single family homes and which income levels would gain access to these neighborhoods? We did not present that so directly in the slides we had here. I think, you know, we presented what would, what would the value of a, a sort of a new missing middle type unit be and what are, what are the, what are the new replacement homes selling for and and we didn't we didn't we didn't present a slide that showed those on the same page and compared them but what i would tell you is you know yeah it's it's a lot less costly for a much smaller missing middle unit where there's you know between two and four units on the lot as compared to that 1.5 million dollar replacement home um or up above two million in some neighborhoods so while you know, while we would say that that the missing middle unit is definitely not as low cost as we would like it to be, you know, it is probably in many places, you know, around, if you go back to that map that we had shown, you know, it, it's, it's pricey, you know, up to 700,000 in some places, it's still a lot less than what the replacement homes are selling for. And probably any new home would be more expensive than after a couple decades anyway as second second yeah. home buyers come in third home buyers yeah and what we find i mean it really will vary by by geography and it's really just trying to to create opportunities for uh, homes in every you know neighborhood that is more attainable uh, homes that are more attainable than what would otherwise be built and um you know, it, it's, you know, certainly not. And there's been a lot of confusion. People think, well, and, they, and they'll respond, this is not affordable housing. And that's not been the focus of this. We have many other policies and Lisa's talked about things that we have in Thrive Montgomery 2050, our general plan that really do focus on opportunities to be able to improve, uh, you know, our existing, you know, strong efforts on affordable housing. This is another aspect of housing that we're focused on that certainly is market rate, but it's just opening up, uh, having more options and more choices for people that are, more attainable to more households, so. Okay, here's a question on the environmental side. Eric is curious 
how or whether your analysis considered the carbon and climate impact of different housing types or sizes, given that the example of a 4,000 square foot home um, or household likely carries a larger climate impact than the 1,500 square foot home. Maybe that's the next step. So um, uh, we did not look at the, the carbon climate impact through our modeling. I think that's something that has come up a lot with our with concerns with the community. So we're you know actively looking at ways to analyze that. But I will say that one of the things that we, we've taken to heart that was really set in motion with Thrive is the, the best environmental policy is a good housing policy. If you can concentrate density and you know near your neighborhoods where there's transit and access to amenities and employment centers, that's certainly a, a good thing in terms of climate impact when you can help reduce that VMT. So that's something that we took to heart through this initiative. All right, sounds good. Maybe the, the reason for doing it in the first place. Um, all right, well, thank you all for the presentation and thank everyone for joining in and attending, sticking it out to the end for those who are still hearing my voice. Uh, this session was recorded and will be available uh, through a link later in the week. And um, please, I ask you to join us for the rest of the conference sessions happening throughout the next few days. You can check our website at ncac.planning.org for the schedule. And uh, thank you all for joining us. Have a great day.